It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be on Tyron and Nicole's team. Uh, we love you guys and uh, think highly of you, pray for you often, and consider it a privilege to talk to you guys. Uh, I, somebody asked me yesterday, and I said, we probably know 80% of you. And just uh, over the years, just thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your faithfulness serving Jesus in your various churches. Thank you for putting him first. Thank you for uh, uh, moving through adversity. And, and for those that we don't know yet, I pray that we will get to know you. And uh, my, my prayer is that you will go home and you will bear fruit and you will allow God to work in your life. Tyron had a word yesterday about keys. It wouldn't be one big key this time, but there are a lot of little keys. So if you've ever been in New York City, those people on their doors, they got eight locks. And uh, to, you can't get out until they're all unlocked, you know. There's a chain lock, and there's a deadbolt, and there's a this. And, and uh, one by one, those, those keys are turning those locks. And, and I pray that from the most seasoned veterans among us and saints among us to the, to the new newbies in Christ, you'll go home better equipped, better able to represent Jesus in your, in your sphere of influence. It, it is an amazing thing. And I just want to say this to the... Please don't be offended uh, to the olders among us. I'll talk to the youngers in a second, but you can decide who you're on. I'm not going to touch that one. But to the olders among us, the success of the kingdom in your church, in your sphere of influence, in a large part depends on you, uh, that you will be supportive of the generation coming through, uh, that you will follow them in their leadership, in other words, taking a step back and, and allowing them, making it easy for them to lead. It's not easy to lead somebody older than you, uh, but to make it easy for them. Don't quit. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep loving and caring. You have a job to do until Jesus takes you home. Uh, don't stop there, uh, but keep serving him, but, but make it easy uh, for those. And to the youngers among you, uh, I want to encourage you, stay, stay faithful. Good. Don't think that you know it all. I, and and, and I know I'm an older person. I was where you are. I thought I had it all figured out. I did have it all figured out <laughs> in my 20s. I knew it. I really did. And then when I was in my 30s, I go, oh, looking at it from this direction, it's a little bit different. And then you get in your 40s and 50s and 90s and 100s, you... You, you go, ah, these things are true, and I didn't know it all. In fact, I think I know less now than I ever did. And so um, just keep listening. Walk in humility, young people. Uh, uh, keep listening. Take notes. You're, I'm a former teacher. You cannot remember everything you hear. Take notes. At least the things that God tells you, make sure you open up something and write it down. Uh, write down the vision. We're instructed. Okay, so... It's a privilege to be here. It all begins with Jesus. When I was a kid, uh, I didn't know my dad. My mom died when I was five. I went to foster homes. I moved in with a family that were, were believers. And it's a miracle that I had a second chance in life. I soon began to hear about Jesus. And at eight years old, I walked down the aisle of our little Bible church in Santa Barbara, California, and gave my heart to Jesus. I've never, ever, ever, ever once regretted that. Jesus has always been faithful. I love him more today than I ever have. And it begins, in my life, it began with him there and uh, his hand upon me. I have not always been faithful. I wish I had. He always has been faithful. Always, always, always has been faithful. Uh, so uh, this year I've been preaching through, uh, I started out preaching in Galatians. We went through Galatians talking about freedom. Uh, I just want to encourage you, make sure that once Jesus sets you free, that you stay free. Why did Jesus set you free? So that you'd be free. Not free to do whatever you want, you know, but free to walk away from a backpack of shame and guilt and unforgiveness and bitterness and regret. We walk around with these things saying, oh, yes, Jesus forgave me, but I still got to hold on to this. I'm going to add something to the gospel. There's only one gospel, and it's Jesus, period. You cannot add anything to the gospel. Paul got so ticked at the Galatians. You read between the lines. 
He goes, God, please help me to write this nicely to them, but I am ticked at them because they are going back to this bondage that they were freed from, and I'm mad at the devil, and I'm irritated at them. Please help them get this. Now I'm going to write this really nice. You read between the lines in Galatians. And so it was for freedom that Christ set us free. I hate rules. I'm one of those kind of people that hate rules. I know that all you love rules. Uh, you like to follow rules and all those kind of things, but it's not Jesus plus the rules. It's not Jesus plus this or uh, any other thing added. You know, r rules. People tell me I should eat natural foods. I said, most people die of natural causes, you know? <laughs> so I don't want to follow rules. The rules are always changing. You can drink coffee. You can't drink coffee. You can do this. You can't do that. And so anyway, never mind. So. But when Jesus set us free, we're free to serve him. Yeah. We're free without any adding in anything to that. It's an affront to the gospel when we think we can add something to what Jesus did on the cross. Oh, I'll feel guilty just for a little while. You know, I did something really, really, really bad as a believer. I know I shouldn't have done that, and I, I need to feel guilty for at least a little while. You know, maybe a month. No, a month is too long. Maybe I'll tithe on that month, and I'll just feel guilty for three days and go, oh, I'm so sorry. No, you're trying to add to what Jesus did at the cross. He said it's finished. And you can't add, it, add to that. So freedom, stay free. Don't go back to bondage. And um, I want to talk about the Corinthians again. They're getting, they're getting battered this time, the Corinthian church. So Paul writes to them, and, and um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, starting in verse uh, 1, he talks to the Corinthians. Now, here's what happened. Real briefly, the churches in Macedonia had no money. They were poor churches. Paul asked them, can you send some money to Jerusalem? They're in famine. They're really hurting. Can you send some? Macedonia said yes. He said to the church in Corinth, could you send some money? They were a really rich church. And they said, yes, we will send some money to Jerusalem. So a year later, the Macedonians, the poor church, not only sent money to Jerusalem, but they sent more than they pledged. And the church in Corinth, the rich church, had sent nothing yet. And Paul's saying, you need to finish what you started. So here he, he's talking to them nicely. All right, but read uh, between the lines here. Uh, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they're very poor but they're also filled with abundant joy. Mm. Abundant joy is an amazing thing. My friend Russ Doty and I, we went to uh, East Germany right after the wall came down. The Soviet Union collapsed overnight without a shot. Read your history books. It was an amazing thing. It was a God thing. So we go over there. They've been in poverty for 30 years, and the whole country is dark and gray and gloomy and no, no maintenance on the outside of anyone's house for over 30 years. And we opened the doors of these, these believers' house that they, and we were staying at, and it was like the Wizard of Oz. You open the door, and it goes into color. And there was life in there. And there, there was old-fashioned furniture, but in, in perfect repair, spick and span clean. And there were smiles on their faces, joy. The, the love of Jesus was in their heart. That's an evidence that he's there. It's an amazing thing. Regardless of their condition of their country, regardless of their the finances, they had nothing they had full joy because they had Jesus, which has overflowed in rich generosity. That's an outward working of what's taking place in our heart is this generosity thing. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers of Jerusalem. And they did it more than we had hoped for, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord. That's the gospel. We give our heart, our life to Jesus. We give ourselves completely and totally to him. Not so that he'll love us, but because he loves us. We don't try to do all these things and then come to Jesus. We come to Jesus. And then as a result of that, we live a life of generosity and influence and impact in our region. So that's the gospel. They gave themselves to the Lord first and to us, just as God wanted them to. So he goes on, and you can read that further. He says, now you guys finish what you started. So I want to talk about freedom with a little practical application. Freedom from a poverty spirit. 
I don't know if you've ever heard that term before, a poverty spirit, poverty mindset, a poverty attitude, uh, things like that. The church and our nation is full of this. Um, first of all, what a poverty spirit is not, let me define it for you. A poverty spirit is not demonic possession. I'm not talking about, you got this spirit and came down on you. Now, I'm talking about the mindset, a frame of reference, the way we view the world. Now, there could be demonic influence. There could be some stuff in there, and that's between you and the God. Maybe, uh, God, maybe you haven't repented of something that he told you to do because you're gripped by this and a cycle of oppression in your family or history or something. It could be, so get that dealt with. Uh, but I'm not really talking about that. And also, um, poverty... Uh, Poverty mindset or poverty spirit is not poor in spirit. Some of you are going, hey, wait a minute. Jesus said on, uh, in Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So a uh, poverty spirit is not poor in spirit. Uh, poor in spirit just means substitute the word humble. Blessed are the humble in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, poor in spirit means when we come to Jesus, we bring nothing Nothing. We come to Jesus in abject poverty. We have nothing to offer. We, ha we offer him nothing. He gives us everything. So that's poor in spirit. That's how we, you can't come to Jesus unless you've repented. We, we got to get rid of this thing where we just come to Jesus because we're thinking about it. And then years later down, then we'll repent. No, you must Come to him knowing that you have nothing and nothing. Like Paul fell at the light of Jesus. He knew he had nothing. He had no hope of mercy uh, without the grace of God coming in and bringing forgiveness. So James 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And also number three, poor in spirit does not mean I must be poor financially. Um, it could be. And financial prosperity or poorness is relative anyway. 80% um, of the world's population today lives on less than $10 a day. Could you live on $10 a day? 80%, four out of five live on less than $10 a day. So it's, it's relative. You're comparing yourself to your neighbor because he drives a Toyota and you drive a Yugo. And, and he's comparing himself to the, his neighbor who drives a Mercedes, you know? And it's all comparison. And our sphere of influence is all wealthy, we're all wealthy. Uh, we live on the wealthiest nation in the history uh, of the world. And it's not, you know, financial poverty is not, there's no um, virtue in financial poverty. Financial poverty in the Bible is always a curse. It's always associated with a curse. There's no blessing of poverty. I bless you with no money. It's not in the Bible. It's not there. So, but you do see God saying in Isaiah 66 too, I'll bless those who have humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my word. Here's what I want you to remember. Big block letters. What is a poverty spirit? A poverty spirit rejects the sufficiency of God. God is not enough. I don't believe he's enough. He told Paul, by grace is sufficient for you. Paul was in a whirlwind of hurt. And he, he pled with God. And God said, my grace is enough for you. Uh, it's enough. The sufficiency of God. He is self-sufficient. He is all-sufficient. And he's all we need. We don't need anything else. And you can go straight to Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Jesus, the good shepherd, is our shepherd. There is nothing that we need. Everything that we truly need, he will take us uh, care of us uh, with. Uh, whether it's a broken relationship, whether it's poverty, financial poverty, whether it's a struggle at work or a boss or a neighbor or, or a broken relationship between husband and wife, he is enough. Jesus said, I am your shepherd and I am enough. You shall not want for anything. And that crosses all cultures. It crosses all times and centuries. It crosses every situation. Jesus is enough for your dream. He's enough for what God put in your heart. He's enough to provide for that. He is enough to provide health for your body and get through a, a, a difficult situation. He's enough to help you overcome your weight problem or addiction problem. He's enough. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Get that into your spirit. That's good. A poverty spirit says, oh, 
yeah, that sounds really good, but you know, I'm really going through something that other people aren't going through. That's a poverty spirit. So, what can a poverty spirit look like? So, sorry, but I'm a dad, and I'm going to punch you and then hug you. All right? And then I'm going to punch you again and hug you again. Then I'm going to punch you again and hug you again. All right? I'm talking about truth. So, here's what a poverty spirit could look like. All right? Are you often jealous of what other people have? Do you feel that happiness is a destination and not a journey? Someday, my prince will come. Do you resent it when something good happens to someone else, even just a little bit? Do you never seem to be content? Are you pessimistic about your future? Punch, hug, punch, hug. I love you guys. Are you constantly struggling with your finances? Do you sometimes wallow in self-pity? Saying, if only I had caught that touchdown in high school. If only I had got that raise. If only I had that person's opportunities. If only I was born in a different family or a different nation. I could have been a contender. So all the old people just laughed. You notice that, young people? You have no idea what I just said. All right. So those are the olders among us. So. It's because you didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> Do you find that you speak sarcastically about people who have more than you do? And, and listen, this is too much. You can just email me for my notes, and um, and I'll send them to you. It's tyrant at ncmi.net, and so. <laughs> do you ever make decisions based on fear? Do you focus on what you don't have rather than what you do have? Do you try to keep up with the neighbors by living beyond your means? Are you a hoarder? Do you find yourself spending most of your spare time on money and entertainment? You do you find you spend most of your spare time and money on entertainment. You don't have a financial plan for your life, but you do find yourself daydreaming about winning the lottery. I thought a long time about these. I want you to know. When you need money for the Coke machine, do you look in between the seat crevices in your car because you haven't cleaned it in three years? <laughs> Have you given up thinking that God would or could ever bless you? Do you think, that's why we're here, there's no way you could ever plan a church? Because you're not smart enough, because you're not equipped enough, because you don't have enough resources. If you've said yes to just one of the above, then no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you got to decide for yourself. If some of those things ring true, I'm sure it gets in all of us. It's in our culture that God is not enough, Jesus is enough. He's enough. So, some handles here. What can you do to break a poverty spirit? A uh, few things. Jesus is always the answer. Uh, number one, be thankful. Who are you thankful to first and foremost? Of course. Jesus set me free. When he said, it is finished on the cross, he was thinking of you. A lot of times we just thinking of the, we thought he was thinking of the, the religious people or the Romans there or whatever. No, he was thinking of every single person he died for. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Say, meditate on psalms of thanksgiving. 
Psalm 86, 12 and 13. With all my heart, I'll praise you, O Lord my God. I'll give, you, I'll give glory to your name forever. For your love for me is very great. You have rescued me from the depths of death. Find a song that you, can, that you can play or a playlist that you can get in your heart about the goodness of God. What a recent one for Terry and me is the goodness of God and played it over and over going through the Canadian Rockies and it's just magnificent and beautiful and get, get those things in you about how good God is. I, the, you know, God is good, God, you know, all the time. Like this, it becomes a cliche. No, God is good. Yes. And he's good all the time. And that song says he's, his goodness is running after me. I think that's amazing. That's amazing. Goodness, the goodness in that word, there's just a picture from some artist who wrote the song. And, and it's equated with God. He's running after you. and go, God doesn't run after me. How about this? Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Or if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uppermost parts of the sea, there even your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Psalm 139. That's right. God does run after you. He loves you and he cares for you and he is good. And he's relentless and he won't let you go. Yes. All right, be thankful for that. T parents, teach your kids to be thankful. I know it's a chore. I know you say, say thank you, and they're like this. <laughs> I know it's hard. Teaching, discipline is the same word as discipleship. Those are your first disciples. Teach them to be grateful, to be thankful, all right? So be thankful. Number two, be a good steward of what God has already given you. God has given a lot of us so much, and we don't even realize it. It's an amazing thing. Uh, first of all, uh, be a good steward of everything and every, everything you are and everything you hope to be and everything you have. That's the first one, of everything you have or ever hope to be. So, about 1980, I was in, uh, in a good church. We had gone to a good church and uh, started going there. And it's late, it's, the name of the church later became Southlands and... and uh, I was uh, in my fifth year. I was becoming a teacher. I was doing my student teaching. We had no money. We had two little kids, a one-year-old or a three-year-old and a two-year-old. I don't know. They were little. And, um, and I had a poverty spirit. We lived in an apartment building, not down, far down the, the uh, street from Southlands. And, and uh, it was Saturday. And I was going to... We must have been hearing some stuff at church about this because I went out there and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Uh, go somewhere, I don't remember what it was, but I, I just stood out in the uh, parking lot, and it was like a quarter of the size of this room, maybe 15 cars, 12 cars in there, and I, I, I stand out there, and I, I see my car. Now, this car, we bought it brand new. It was the cheapest car ever sold in America, a Datsun B210, and it had a 1600cc motor. The Hondas out now are bigger than that. The Honda motorcycles are bigger than that. And so this thing cost $1,680 brand new. And it lasted like three weeks. So this was two years later. And I just stopped. And I look at my, I look at my car. And I look around the parking lot. And sorry for this. This is what I thought. I said, I have the crappiest car in this parking lot. It is bad. And, and right there, something hit me. This was an epiphany, a God moment in my life. I said, God, you gave me that car, and I'm not taking care of it. It was a mess. Stuff in the back seat, on the floor. And, and I'm ashamed to say that. It was dirty. And uh, it fit my spirit. What kind of spirit did I have? Poverty spirit. Right there, I just repented, said, God, I'm so sorry. Jesus, you're enough. I don't know if I said all these words, but I know that that's what I meant at that time. You're enough. From this point on, I am going to take care of my stuff. I'm going to take care of the gift you get, give, me, give me, and I'm going to take care of my family. I'm going to do the best I can with what I have, and I will be content with it. And so I went instead, wherever I was going, I went to AutoZone or something and got some wax and polish and rags, and, and I spent all day on that thing. I vacuumed it. Why? I asked Terry, can I please have that yellow bath uh, rug in the thing? And the driver's seat was ripped, and I covered it with a yellow bath mat. And... Um, <laughs> 
it was like really, it was way more comfortable than vinyl, but, uh, and then I, it was afternoon, I got out there, and I looked around the, the parking lot, and I go, all right, now I'm only the third crappiest car. <laughs> 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 Take care of your stuff. God gave you that. If you understand what stewardship is, it's not yours. It's God's. Take care of the gifts that he's given you. 1 Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as a good st uh, stewards of God's very grace. Are you a musician? a musician? Use that gift. Some of you are songwriters and you've never written a song because you're not stewarding the gift that God gave you. Some of you are preachers and teachers and good homemakers and, 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 and scientists. And I hope somebody from this room discovers a cure for cancer and AIDS and, and, and all those kind of things. Because we want to use the gifts that God gave us. Are you stewarding those well? Teachers, scientists, neighbors, develop your gifts. We need to be good stewards of our time. Time is precious. We all have the same amount, 24 hours a day. Ephesians 5.15, look carefully how you walk. Not as the unwise, but as the wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Be a good steward of the people God has given you. Your first people are your little ones at home. Be good stewards of them. They're not yours. They belong to God, and he's going to ask you what you did with them. Be good stewards of those in your small groups or connect groups. Be good stewards of the people in your church. If you're a business owner or a manager, be good stewards of those people. Be content. Uh, the fourth one there, or third one is, be content with who you are and what you have. Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And then D, we have to confront it head on. And the only way you confront it he head on is with Jesus, and he will plow through whatever wall that is. You gotta confront it. Don't whitewash it. Repent from it if it's true for you. And change your self-image. I am not this person. I am a son or a daughter of Jesus. I am a, a heir of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's my identity. I am a Christian, a Christ follower. And choose to believe that God actually does want to bless you. Good. Hebrews eleven six. It's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Yeah. And speak words of life. Words of life. I mean, you know, we reap what we sow. Speak words of life. Good. Quit talking negatively about people with money. Good. Your neighbors who have a better car than you. Quit. Just, just look at your family and, and your circle of friends and see the words that they use in reference to other people. And quit being negative about that. Wealth is not ungodly. Wealth is not godly. There's godly people who are poor and there's ungodly people who are rich. It doesn't matter if you have money. It matters whether money has you. So quit talking negatively about that and rejoice when somebody succeeds. Yeah. Yeah. Throw off limits, number four, of what you think God can or cannot do. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. And my friend, Tyron Daniel said, whatever the God-given vision is that we have in our life, there will be provision. There will be provision. If God gave you that dream, he'll provide for it. And I want to leave you with this, dream big dreams. Dream big dreams. I got a, I got a big pencil. Wait a minute, I'm pausing it at five seconds. So, otherwise the dog starts barking. <laughs> and we don't want that. I got this big fat blue pencil. It was my inheritance from my friend Jesse Mason. He had it on his desk for years. And it's a big, it's a real pencil, but it's like this round, and it's this long, and it says, dream big dreams. I want to encourage you to dream big dreams. And I heard a song the other day, Dream Small, and there's truth to that. It means don't forget the little things along the way. You know, those are a dream, part of the dream too. I'm not talking about that. I mean, God gave you a dream, and for you, it's a big dream. And if you can accomplish that dream in your own strength, the dream is too small. Make sure it's a dream that only God can accomplish. Otherwise, you'll take credit for it. Amen.
If you, got, if you want God to release you from a poverty spirit or mindset or whatever that is, please stand up. Father, we thank you that you are enough. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Whatever our history is, whatever level of seriousness this is, and for us as individuals, I pray that you'd break this now in the name of Jesus. I pray that we would trust you for every dream, for every promise, for everything that you've done. And it's all because of what Jesus did at the cross. It's all because that you are God who you say you are, and you did the things that you said you would do, and you will do the things that you said you will do. We trust you, we love you, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.